you got. Okay, Peter, you got this, you got this. What the hell are you wearing? It's my suit. Perhaps no costume in the MCU is quite as iconic as Spider-Man's brilliant red and blue costume. Ever since he swung onto the big screen in Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man, he moved the bar forward for what audiences and fans could expect from comic-accurate super suits. So how did they create that first costume and the costumes from the two Spider-Men that followed him? Let's find out. For Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, they made the radical choice to make Spider-Man look like Spider-Man. At that point in Hollywood, superheroes weren't seen as the safe bet that they are now. Batman Forever and Batman and Robin made the entire genre look so silly that general audiences just weren't feeling it anymore. That's why the black leather look of Marvel's Blade or the early X-Men movies resonated so much harder with audiences in that time period. The first Spider-Man movie took a page out of the playbook of the first Superman movie by unrepentantly portraying his exact look as it was on the page. That's getting ahead of ourselves though. The first suit Peter wears in the film is not his iconic blue and red look at all. My name's the Human Spider. I don't care, get out there. No, he got my name wrong. Get out there, you moron. <sighs> when he decides to go in the ring with Bonesaw, Peter brings a functional costume that doesn't really look all that great. The designers tried out several designs that look like things a high schooler would throw together. They went with the sweatshirt that Peter put a rough spider symbol on, sweatpants, motorcycle gloves, and a knit mask. It's hard to make a costume look ridiculous on purpose, but I'd say they hit the nail on the head. Then it came time for the real Spidey suit, and it took a lot of work. Four months were spent testing different versions of the suit. It required a full body cast and a head cast from Tobey Maguire. The biggest challenge came when trying to make Spidey look streamlined and agile, while also giving him that bulk that comic fans are used to. Part of the solution to this problem was that they made the webbing that ran along the suit somewhat three-dimensional to give the suit a bulk look. The shading of the suit was also colored in a way to accentuate the muscles on Spidey's body as he stretched the suit and moved. The eyepieces had to be made by hand and attached separately to the suit. It was such a tight fit that poor Tobey Maguire had to be sewn into it. As far as the CG goes, the Spidey suit itself provided the team with a bit of a break. As anyone who has seen Luke Skywalker's face in The Mandalorian will tell you, the hardest thing to animate using computer effects is the human face. That's the thing that humans are trained to look at the most, so we know instinctively if something's off. So Spider-Man having his entire face covered, oh, that was a dream. Just compare the CGI Doc Ock versus the CGI Spidey in their big train fight, and it is easy to see which one holds up better. The challenge for CG Spidey wasn't so much the look of the character, but the movement. They didn't want it to be blatantly obvious that it was an animated character, so they took close attention to how Spidey would move. What was his personality? They had to balance Spider-Man's grace with a certain level of improvisation. Spider-Man doesn't know where the next swing is going to come from, which gives him a small degree of hesitance, which makes the whole thing even more thrilling. So, how do you follow up a look as iconic as the one from the first Spider-Man movie? That was the challenge they faced with redesigning the Web Slinger with The Amazing Spider-Man. For the new look, director Mark Webb wanted it to seem grittier and more real. Photos of bikers in vibrant tights were used as reference photos. Everything. Spandex. The Spidey was made to look leaner than ever before. All of the lines of the suit were made to accentuate how aerodynamic and athletic Spider-Man was. The bulk and awkward moments of the old Spidey were gone, and the lithe, confident parkour Spidey was born. The movie also took issue with one of the biggest problems from the first film. How could Peter Parker make that suit? The amazing suit went out of its way to show how Peter could have made this himself. Sunglasses were modified to act as lenses. Of course, the sunglasses had to be specially designed for the movie, but they were to look like Peter had just pulled them off of a pair that he'd found. The bottoms of tennis shoes were cut away and added to the costume to make it seem like he'd thrown it together himself. The second franchise also went away with the organic web shooter idea of the original trilogy. They followed Stan Lee's original concept of mechanical web shooters. In order to keep that DIY look, they found leather wristwatch bands that could be easily purchased by Peter while also concealing the shooters when he wanted to hide them in his street clothes. For the CGI web-slinging segments, they also decided to go in a new direction. This time, they wanted to show things from Spidey's perspective as he rushes through the skyline of New York. They wanted to show the hectic, jarring pace of web-slinging. So for a costume that impressed everyone behind the scenes, so much so that co-star Emma Stone declared to him that he literally was Spider-Man, how did the fans react? 
Uh, not well. The new look did not go over with pretty much anyone, as it was seen to be too drastic a shift from what fans were used to. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 production pretty much went back to the Raimi films. The big change they made this time was to make the eyes much bigger and more expressive than ever before. This was a friendlier, more classic Spider-Man than the one from the first film. It was also a lot more comfortable for Andrew Garfield with hidden zippers and padding. As any superhero actor will tell you, the most important feature of the suit is that it needs to be taken off once nature calls. So, how do you redesign Spider-Man again when we've seen him redesigned twice already? Well, for Captain America Civil War, they decided to go with the obvious thing. They went back to the comics. The new suit was to look as much like the original Spider-Man costume as possible. Narratively, they were also given some freedom, since Tony Stark was the one who designed it, instead of Peter. This suit did not have any cut-up sneakers or broken glasses. Wait, it's nothing, Mr. Stark. It's, it's perfect, thank you. The most novel idea that they pursued was emulating the expressive eyes Spider-Man has in the comics. In all of the previous suits, the lens were fixed. Now, Tony Stark designed lenses that would help Peter focus on the task at hand and help communicate his emotions to the audience. This suit, however, used a lot more CGI than all the others. Those expressive eyes were all CG, and often, Tom would film an emotion capture suit instead of the Spidey costume. So how did they manage to show off so much Tom Holland with so much CGI? Well, they lucked out by casting a trained dancer from the infamous Billy Elliot musical production that is well known for training kids to be all kinds of graceful. Tom could do flips and stunts that the previous two Spideys would never consider. Not only that, but Tom got really into gymnastics all on his own. It was a great reference point for their Spider-Man to actually do the Spider-Man stunts while putting in his personality. As a younger and sillier Spidey, he was also the clumsiest. Gone was the parkour Spider-Man Andrew Garfield portrayed or the bulky Spider-Man Tobey Maguire embodied. This was a kid right out of a John Hughes movie who needed to contrast with the adult superheroes all around him. Unlike the other Spideys, Tom Holland's superhero goes through several different costumes. The Iron Spidey suit, which is taken right out of the comics, is 100% motion capture. A lot of the things the suit did were made up apparently right on the spot. On the other end of the spectrum is the Stealth Suit, or Night Monkey Suit. This needed to look tactile and very different from the standard Spidey fare. It had to look like something Nick Fury could throw together. There are influences of Black Ops agents, Black Widow, Hawkeye, and Captain America in there. Then there's the official Far From Home suit that was meant to show the newer, more grown-up Spider-Man. The light blue is traded out for a more serious black. The shoulders have a little more muscle to them. Everything about the suit was to say that Spidey was no longer in Tony Stark's shadow. It had less technology and focused more on what makes Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Is this Tom Holland's final form? Of course not. We'll just have to watch No Way Home to find out what's next. As impressive as all this is, perhaps no Spidey suit is as impressive as the Japanese Spider-Man's was. No muscles, no CGI, no expensive budget, just a guy in a red and blue suit of jammies fighting the forces of evil with his giant robot. Don't even get me started on the legend that was Turkish Spider-Man. Maybe that'll be another video.